Apology John. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first SASIG webinar of September, I think. Have we had one earlier this week, Danny? I don't know. Um, I'll introduce myself in, my se in a second, but just to set the scene, what we're here to talk about today. Um, 2022, the UK government launched the Government Cybersecurity Strategy, which was fantastic. And like many people, I'm sure, on the call, I read that. And one of my first thoughts, I think, like everybody else, is like, this is great. It's a fantastic strategy. It's really setting the scene for where we need to be. But now what? In my organization, what do I need to do with this strategy? And I was very glad to find out that one of the things that came out to help organizations, especially critical national infrastructure, uh, was a scheme called Govershaw. So it's a, a scheme looking at how you can actually set yourself up for success, how you can actually make sure that the systems that you're working on are secure. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because you're not here to listen to me talk about this. Uh, I'm, we're very lucky to have Isabel Hawkin here from the British Standards Institute, BSI, who is very much the expert on this. And today she's going to be talking us through the scheme and sharing some really valuable recommendations with us about how to streamline and expedite, expedite the process in a very practical way. Um, next slide, please, Danny. Uh, as for me, um, some of you will know me. My name's John Scott. I've um, previously been at BT and at uh, the Bank of England running their security awareness program there. Um, but now I'm, a, I'm the lead security researcher for Culture AI. We're a little startup working in the human risk management space. We're very, very proud to be uh, joining SASIG as partners from this year on. Um, and um, yeah, very, very excited to, be, uh, to continue our SASIG journey. Um, speaking of the supporters, if we can have the next slide, please, Danny. Um, we are, as always, SASIG are in incredibly grateful to all of our supporters. Uh, these are the organizations who think what we are doing is important, who think what we're doing is useful and want to make sure that we can keep doing it. Um, we are not a sales organization. We are not actually, uh, these people are not uh, bugging you with, uh, from the lists that we sign up when you sign up to SASIG, what they're doing is they're supporting SASIG in making sure that we can continue our live and our webinar program. And speaking of our webinar program, next slide, please, Danny. Um, this is what the next couple of weeks looks like in terms of uh, the webinars. Uh, you can see we've got a wide variety of different um, ones going on. So looking from security culture to vulnerability management to generative AI for phishing, which is one that I'm particularly interested in. And then actually what does, um, what are the, uh, the true stories and the fictions about insider risk? So some really, really interesting and hopefully a wide variety of topics going on over the next fortnight. Uh, next slide, please, Danny. Now, Obviously, we uh, we put out a lot of webinars. We're also very happy to be back in the swing of things in terms of our face-to-face -face events. And uh, even more importantly, that we're making sure that our face-to-face -face events are not all London-centric. So we've got, again, over the next uh, month, uh, next couple of months, we've actually got four events, four face-to-face -face events coming up. One in Dublin, uh, looking at meeting today's cybersecurity challenge, looking at the skills gap, persistent threats from criminal gangs, emergence of new technologies. Uh, one where I'll actually be uh, helping host in London at BT, uh, looking at how do we actually take a top-down approach to security culture and how we actually align motivation and behavior when it comes to both compliance and culture change. Over in Guildford at the university there, we're gonna be looking at cyber and the future of national resilience. So we've been looking at how the government national resilience strategy um, uh, is going to play out, how we, as we adopt new technologies, we bring in vulnerabilities and how we actually look at making our technology safe to use. And then in November, again, back in London, we're going to be looking at certifications, skills gaps, career progressions, all of the, all of the things that go together, defining what this cybersecurity profession is. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. So, Moving on from that and looking into next year, 
Um, we had an incredibly successful big SASIG this year in London. We're looking at um, uh, we are looking at re uh, uh, at running our flagship conference again in Tuesday, on Tuesday, twenty third of April, twenty twenty four. So this is very much a save the date notice. It will be based around Liverpool Street in London again, um, and we're hoping for it to be even bigger and better than it was this year. So if you'd like to register on the website, there's a, a QR code if you want there, or I'm sure we can put the link into the email you'll get after the uh, after this talk. Um, and that will then um, that will then allow you to be on the waiting list for us telling you when registration opens in November. So I went to this this year. This was a really great event. It would be lovely to see you there again. Sorry, Danny. Next slide, please. Um, Couple of final bits and pieces, and then we'll get on to the main show. Uh, if you don't know very much about SASIG, you can reach us on our social media platforms. So LinkedIn is probably the most useful because it's you know rich content there, and a, you get to meet the SASIG community. Uh, you can, if you've got friends who are interested in joining SASIG, they can do so through the website, and of course that gives them access to all of our webinars, including all the past ones and all our upcoming events, and then. As long as it's still going and as long as Elon Musk still wants it to keep running, we are on X, Twitter as was, uh, to uh, where we'll push out short form updates about what we're trying to do. Final slide, please, Danny. So um, just a few house rules. Uh, as much as we would hope that you will hold to the spirit of Chatham House, we can't enforce it as much as we do for the physical meetings. What we do ask is that you please respect the speaker, Isabel, and anybody who raises a question. The value of SASIG is in the interaction. So, and people raise questions and ask, um, ask for comments because of that value, because of people being willing to share. So please, we ask, just respect that sharing. Um, if you do want to ask questions, interact or so on, there is a chat bar at the bottom of the screen, and there is a raise hand if you'd like to speak, and there's a Q and A if you want to um, actually send a question directly to me, to Danny and to Isabel. We will be taking questions throughout. I'll be keeping an eye on this while Isabel is talking. And if there's a relevant point where I can drop a question in, I will. Otherwise, we will definitely have time for questions at the end. Couple of final points. Sorry, Danny, I keep, I keep waiting, don't I? You think, oh, you must mean move on. <laughs> Couple of final points. Um, we will record this webinar like we do with all of ours, and it will be available to watch later. You can share it with colleagues. In fact, we'd be very grateful if you did share it with colleagues. If you've got ideas for future webinars, or if you'd like to contribute, please drop us a line and let us know. And as much as possible, spread the word of SASIC. Try and get your teams to join in, try and get your colleagues to join in, because the more people who are contributing, the more valuable this is as an organization. Next slide, please, Danny. There you go, see, there we are. Thank you very much for listening to me, Burble. Um, we're going to hand over to Isabel and um, thank you all very much for your attendance today. Isabel, over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction and hello to everyone. Um, uh, as John was saying, my name is Isabel Forkin. Uh, I uh, work for BSI um, and uh, I'll be taking you through uh, some practical approaches to Govershaw and generally giving an overview of um, Govershaw as, uh, as a scheme and, and our experience um, within BSI and my experience personally um, working with it. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Now, can I check? Can everyone see? my screen is it all working okay all good Very thank well. you as well fabulous excellent um so probably the first thing to know is it's new right so um so this is something that we've been working on for some time with some of our clients that were, have been involved um uh, for a while um however it's getting to the point where more and more organizations are being asked to uh, to look at this to engage with it um and so now feels like the time to start talking about well okay let's let's talk about how to approach this um but i think it is probably worth noting just a bit of a caveat at the beginning of the talk this is all based on our experience over the last sort of 12 months ish um and um 
and you know it's still it's still a bit of an evolving process um so just just a bit of a caveat of this is our experience um and what we want to do is really or what i want to do is really help you understand how to approach this um and and hit the deadlines which i know are, are coming fast coming soon for a lot of organizations um but you know it's there's going to be some flexibility that's needed in there as well. Um, so, uh, so onto the slides. Um, <clears throat> my agenda for today is um, to talk firstly about like the background overview, just a, a summary um, of of kind of where this has come from, why it's why it's happening, um, and then uh, whilst the actual implementation has five steps officially uh, from um, cabinet office, um, I personally think of them as two distinct chunks because um, I like to uh, I like to make my my to do list small. So first thing, information gathering that's the self assessment, so scoping self assessment, um, and the second thing then is analysis of that data that you have gathered. Um, so that's kind of how, I, uh, how, how I've arranged it, but we'll go through all of the different steps individually, of course. Um, one thing that I was going to say um, was uh, that this, this talk, <clears throat> um, what I have, what my intention is to make this applicable primarily to those organizations that are required to comply with it, right? So if you are a, a government department or uh, another organization that has been required to actually complete GovAsure, that's really who this talk is aimed at. However, if you are one of the other organizations that are involved, if you are um, an audit company, if you are a, a consultant or some other form of support, um, hopefully the information here is also going to be useful for you. But that's the, the main audience, the main intention was um, those types of people. Um, and also the main thing is don't panic, right? Like, I mean, maybe a little bit of panic because it is very tight time frames and there is a lot to get done. Um, but uh, but but all things are all things are achievable. So. Um, all right, so to start with the overview then. So uh, the background to this is the government cyber security strategy. Um, and that runs through to, or the strategy covers up to 2030. Um, now, I don't, I don't know how many people in the organization have had a chance or in the audience, sorry, have had a chance to read through it. It, it is interesting. I think it's really useful to understand where our government is going in terms of um, its intentions and its plans for, um, for cybersecurity, um, because I think that helps individual organizations then plan themselves to align to that. Um, I think more and more legislation is coming in, so it's really useful to understand actually if that's the direction of travel, um, then then kind of just being prepared for it is really helpful. Um, and the the cybersecurity strategy have these two particular uh, pillars, I think I call them, which is building organizational cyber resilience and defending as one. Um, and you can read more about that in the cybersecurity strategy. I don't want to go into it in too much detail because it's it's available um, to download and um, and access. Uh, but I think it's really useful to understand why GovAsure has happened and why that's being required, and to keep an eye on that this as um, as kind of the intention behind it. Right. The point is to build cyber resilience. The point is to defend as one, have that real kind of comprehensive understanding of government as a whole, for example, um, and, and the UK as a whole. And really get an understanding of where we sit um, as a nation um, and from there be able to make sensible decisions. And that's really where the intention behind all of this is coming from is actually is that data gathering just what is the baseline what is our status right now do we have a good understanding of how secure we are how resilient businesses are um and that that's important and i'll come back later the idea of it's it's data gathering and it is understanding current status um in order to plan for how to improve um so the cabinet office defines these five stages um, and that is um, 
Stage one, organizational context. Who are you as an organization? What is your your core purpose? Um, if it was, if you were a kind of a commercial organization, we would ask it be asking things like, how do you make your money? Um, for non-commercial organizations, it's a little bit difficult to define sometimes, or it can be more difficult, um, but that's still that question of what is your, your core function, your key, um, what is it that you do? Um, uh, once you have a really good understanding of that, then you can start looking at um, what those essential services are that support that, um, the, and then move on to stage two to define the systems that support those services. And this is really about understanding your business and then also the CAF profile, um, which again, I will talk about uh, later, but there's two different profiles, depending on whether you, uh, you are likely to need to defend against the baseline or a slightly higher threat um, actor. And all of those pieces are about your organization, what they do and how, uh, how critical, how, how relevant, how important they are. Um, and that is a communication and a discussion that sits between the cabinet office and your organization. Um, so there is an ongoing communication um, and it is everything else that happens afterwards really hangs off of understanding, particularly the scope and the profile is really important to, to get those absolutely understood throughout uh, everyone who's delivering garbage shop. Like that is a really important piece of work. Uh, the next stage is the self-assessment. Um, this in some ways is probably uh, the most uh, familiar. Uh, you, know, you have a set of requirements, uh, you are asked to assess against them, you gather evidence, that's it. Um, it is also probably the longest stage as well though because it takes a long time to go through everything. And again, we'll go into the structure of the CAF and, um, and that piece. Um, then there's the independent assurance review. So you do your self-assessment, somebody will take that self-assessment and have a look at it just to, uh, to check that you've understood the question properly, the answer makes sense, all of those kind of good things that, uh, that people do for self-assessment because, I mean, this is very much my personal opinion, but I think self-assessment without any any sort of validation from somebody who hasn't filled out the self-assessment is not as it's not terribly helpful because if you know nobody's going to look at your answers you don't necessarily um always really work on making sure that you have the evidence available and things like that. um so um one of the other points uh on the independent assurance review. Um, and again, I, I think I said at the beginning that this is this is an evolving thing, right? So, um, so for lead government departments, um, that's fairly well established that process, you get an external um, company in. Um, for other organizations, so arms length bodies um, and, uh, and some of the other kind of slightly more removed departments, Cabinet Office, um, as I understand it, is planning on having some other options available um, because the independent assessment is, uh, is quite in-depth, can be quite expensive as well. Um, so I believe there's an intention to look at some alternatives for um, the, the lower risk, let's say, uh, organisations. Um, and then the final piece is the final assessment um, and creating that targeted improvement plan. So we've done all of this work, we've baselined, we've understood where we are. Next step is, where do we want to make improvements? So those are all stages. Um, the actual assessment itself uh, is against the CAF. Um, again, I will go into that in more detail later, but um, I suspect a lot of people within the uh, within the audience are familiar with the CAF, right? It's, it's been around for a while, the NIST um, requirements, but just generally it's, it's something that a lot of people within organizations have, have baselined against. Um, and then, so this is BSI's version of um, the Govershaw stages, which is how when we work with organizations, we would then implement it and translate it into kind of practical applicable activities. So, in that initial stage, you're identifying stakeholders, um, 
you know, you're looking at centralized responses. Um, and the majority of the rest of the talk will be around these pieces. Um, so that's kind of the overview. Uh, did we have any questions? I'm just going to pause briefly. Okay. Yeah, we've got, thanks, um, mm -hmm. Isabel. We've got a couple of questions, one from Richard, uh, I think, and tell me if you're going to cover this later on. But he says, not sure how this works for suppliers to govern organisations. My company supply different systems, it's different services using different systems to different government departments. So yeah. what's the interface? Will government departments tell us what aspects we need to cover? Yeah, it's, it's a really, really good question. Um, so uh, as a supplier to government, I, I mean, you, you will need to be having those conversations with the government that you supply or the, you know, the range of government uh, departments that you supply. Um, so I don't have a specific, um, I don't have a specific slide on this. Um, and I think the, the answer is quite, you know, it's a, it's a little bit in depth. So I'll, I'll attempt to answer it now. But if you have follow up questions, we can um, we can discuss it later once I've gone through all of the slides. But um, just because it's quite a big question. Um, so the government organizations are the ones that have to comply. They are the ones that have to answer these questions. They're the ones that have to submit um, through WebCAF and go through that whole process. However, if you supply government, you will absolutely need to be involved in this. Um, so, uh, for example, if we look at, I'll go down to here, you know, if we look at the CAF objectives, you may well uh, provide some services probably that sit around objective B. You know, you may do identity and access control, or you might be a managed SOC, you might be sitting kind of somewhere around C and D. Um, and the requirements that are specified within there, you will be asked that by, by your, your customers. They will need to know how you help them comply because ultimately it's their data that you are providing those services around. I'm making some assumptions about what you do, but um, so yes. What you won't be asked about is stuff that sits, you know, for example, in governance. The governance questions should be answered by the government department who actually has to fill it out, they will need to describe how they do governance and submit that through WebCAF and go through the whole process. Um, you won't need to explain that. What I would say is probably quite a lot of, particularly the stuff that sits up here in um, objective A, as an organization, you should be doing it um, and it will make it much harder to do the rest of uh, the controls, uh, but you, what you'll really be asked about is the controls that you directly affect in your customers. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, um, hopefully that answers the question, but I'm, I'm happy to discuss in a bit more detail. Perfect. Thanks, Isabel. Anything else from the questions? Um, more, well, more, I'm going to be that annoying person, more of a comment than a question. Um, but Tim points, Tim Rogers points out that uh, local government haven't been instructed to adhere to this, which ah. um, is an interesting, I won't quote exactly what he says, but let's call it an interesting and massive oversight. Um, so, yeah, I think there's an interesting point there about maybe there's a wider question about, well, who does this broadly apply to? Is it just central government or is it likely mm -hmm. to roll out central to local government eventually? I would imagine it is likely to roll out um, across a broad range, so um, including local government. I would imagine. Uh, I am not in charge of those decisions, so I, I couldn't tell you. Um, I would say that when we get, get into the details, you'll see that it, it actually ends up being quite a lot of work to do that self-assessment, to gather that evidence, to, to work out kind of as an organisation where you sit and how it works. Um, and a lot of this is really good practice, just general security. Yep. So, Brilliant. thank you. Yes, I, I, I would say, even though you haven't been explicitly asked, it's probably worth starting to think about aligning your policies. You know, as you're doing your policy review, just think about, oh, you know, I think I might end up having to do this, let's align the policies. When you do your internal audits, maybe align your internal audits to, to the CAF. You know, it, it doesn't have to be to the full Baba Shore, but at least aligned to the CAF framework, I think will probably be really helpful in a few different ways, but particularly if this comes in. Okay. 
And one final question. Um, sure. This is from Tim. He said, uh, it's an interesting one. Would you consider a supplier answering billable, uh, sorry, sorry, answering Govershaw questions to be an additional billable activity? Well, I think that that is between you and your, like it depends on your contract, right? If you've got something in your contract that is around, um, you know, the right to audit, what does that say, right? If if you have the right to audit, when you come in and do an audit or when your customers come in and do an audit, is that billable? Um, it depends on how you're commercially set up. Um, as a supplier to government, we probably wouldn't do the work without billing. Um, but at the same time, we do have some internal pieces where if we have multiple different customers, you know, the second customer, the third customer, the fourth customer, it would be much easier to fill that out because we actually already have the answers. So there may be just a piece where we do an internal piece of work that's like, here's our baseline set of responses for the specific work that we do. That would be an internal project that we could then do as kind of, um, oh, what's the what's the word I'm thinking of, but kind of a, a an add-on, you know? A, um, almost, so. almost like a boilerplate answer to those. Yeah, kind of, because it is, well, you would hope that you actually do have basically the same process across all of your customers anyway. So you have to create that boilerplate answer anyway. Um, and then you'll, it'll be like a, a yeah, like a, a an add-on for your customer, you know, uh, uh, there's, the, there's a term that I'm thinking of, but it's kind of like free, but great. Um, I remember the term. Um, but yes, uh, so I think it depends on where you sit in the market. Um, and, a, and a bunch of commercial things that is going to be I different. Think, yeah, I think that's great. And that that's us all caught up on questions. Thanks, Isabel. <laughs> was the introduction over? Um, I said I would be done by quarter two, so I might have to go a little bit, a little bit quicker. So self-assessment um, and, and that data gathering piece. So we're going to talk about how you prepare and how you assess uh, against the requirements. So the prepare piece, of course, is the most important piece in a, a lot of ways. Um, identifying your stakeholders, getting that senior buy-in is really, really critical um, because as you see, when you look at the CAF, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of information being asked, which takes quite a bit of time to gather. Um, there are going to need to be resources put onto this as an actual project. So you need that senior buy-in that is really, really important. Um, and in addition to the senior buy-in, you, you need to talk to the local system owners, probably the local kind of functional owners as well, operations, anybody that's gonna be involved is gonna be really useful to get them knowing about it, bought in as early as possible so that they know it's coming up, they can build it into resource planning, things like that. Um, in addition, uh, scoping the critical functions because of the nature of the questions because they're really detailed um, if you don't really understand the scope of the system that you're answering it for it gets very messy very quickly so um, if you're being asked about for example administrators you really need to understand which systems you're talking about administrators for and how that works is it all kind of because their domain admins means that they're system admins or you know however that works but you really need to understand that at the beginning otherwise you end up or could end up going back and answering the question multiple times from multiple different perspectives as you understand more about the group um, and you, you don't want to double your work on this because it's it is quite a lot anyway um, and the final thing is engaging the centralized support team. So we mentioned the SOC before, that's that's a fairly big piece, business continuity, HR, all of those really traditional control-based, um, uh, all of those departments that have an effect on the overall security of your system. Um, engaging them nice and early just to say hi, you know, make friends, like this, this is coming up, just so you know, we have to do it. Um, please can you help, uh, it, it will be really, really helpful. Um, and then when it comes to assessing, um, so I'm just gonna pop down again. So again, we've got the CAF objectives um, and hopefully people are relatively familiar with that. Um, what we found was um, because this, the questions are on a per system level, right? You do an assessment for your critical systems 
but some of these actually are not on a system level. So particularly a governance, you don't do different governance for different systems. You have an organizational governance scheme, um, policies and processes, staff awareness, um, and your incident response pieces. Those typically are organizational level. And if you're doing multiple different systems, um, you know, if you've got kind of two or three systems you're answering for, it is really, really useful to document those general organizational level things first. So again, so you're only asking once. Um, and that's the overall theme of getting this assessment, self-assessment piece done, is try and work as hard as possible to only ask the question once to the right person and then get the answer and the evidence. Um, the, the most frustrating thing is having to go back over again and, and answer all the questions again. Um, and we've spoken about engaging service owners. Um, uh, but yeah, this and this is the most kind of time consuming activity is going through all the, the um, IGPs, uh, they're called, um, and gathering the evidence. And again, it's, it's useful to gather the evidence as you go through. Um, to, again, just to, to really be as um, uh, time efficient as you can be. So the CAF, um, for anybody who is not aware, um, is split into four objectives. Um, and those four objectives are, I think this is 14, isn't it? Yes, 14 um, principles. Um, you can go on the NCSC website and you can read into the detail of this. Um, what is quite interesting for me, um, and this isn't a new thing particularly anymore, is that half of, certainly half of the objectives are actually about the response to an incident or preparing for being compromised. So it's this move that we've seen generally within UK government, within you know industry generally, is not prevention, it's reduction of risk and then reduction of impact. And there's a really heavy focus on how do you reduce the impact if slash when you, you do get compromised. Um, and that's reflected in the, the CAF. Um, so the way that it works, we've got these four objectives. We have 14 principles. Underneath each one of these principles, um, so I've taken the example of identity and access control, you will have a set of contributing outcomes defined. And under those contributing outcomes, you will have indicators of good practice. And the reason I've included this slide in here is because I think it's really useful um, for anybody who's not familiar with the CAF to really understand the size of the questions being asked, uh, because it is quite a lot. So for this one, identity and access control, they are there are 59 indicators of good practice or IGPs. For each one of those IGPs, you need to provide a statement. So you can imagine overall, I think we end up, I can't remember the exact number, but I think it's a couple, you know, it's a few hundred IGPs that you end up having to answer across the entirety of the CAF. It's not a small undertaking. What is quite good though, is because, um, you know, you've got the bits that sit perhaps in the SOC, you've got different bits sit with different parts of the organization. It's, it, it would hopefully, not just be one person that needs to answer this, but that's why it needs to be set up as a project, get all the buy-in from the stakeholders, because at some point you are gonna send them bits of spreadsheets and say, can you please answer a hundred uh, of these questions? Um, I'm just gonna pause for a second there and see if there are any questions, or comments around that. Yeah, we've got a couple of um, um, really interesting ones. One from Tim Rogers. Uh, says on the point of alignment, we currently try and address IC twenty seven zero one. We pivot to we can pivot to CAF, I guess, but it'd be good to see if there's a cross reference regarding CAF versus twenty seven zero one versus cyber essentials versus you know add your standard, I guess, um, to quickly see how much coverage we've already got. Yeah, do you um, know of anything? So uh, well, so I know that we have our own internal cross references. Um, I think at the moment they are primarily going to be what people have worked on sort of more internally or consultants and people like that, um, rather than a published thing. 
I believe if you go onto the NCSE website where they they publish the CAF, um, yeah. they will have links um, to different um, standards that are relevant. So where it does link out to 27,001, I, I believe on the NCSE website, it does say that, but it's not in like a nice spreadsheet that you can download and just kind of go, oh yeah, yeah, tick, 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 tick kind of thing. Okay. Cool. Um, on that, I should call out Paul Trosdale, who's doing a sterling job of um, finding all the things that you refer to and putting links into the chat. So he's doing a brilliant Thank job. You. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, another question um, uh, from Andrew Inslee. I know the scheme is aimed at organisations in government or working with government. Could you see GovAssure becoming a standard used outside of the public sector to demonstrate a level of security? I think that probably not GovAssure uh, as it sits today, you know, because it is a, a large piece of work looking at all of the IGPs. I think unless there's a legislative uh, or regulatory push for that, most organisations might shy away a little bit for going for the full kind of comment against all of the IGPs, um, certainly in kind of the mid long term but um what i would think is quite likely is starting to look at this contributing outcomes level and i think that is potentially the level where people will start to um start to the thing is you can't certify against calf uh, which is another reason why potentially people won't necessarily align purely to that but like within 27,001, you could actually define CAF as your control set. That's, mm -hmm. into, like, that's a 27,001 thing. But, um, but yeah, you, you could absolutely say this is my control set is what's in CAF. Um, and CAF is nice because it is outcomes focused rather than prescriptive technical controls focused. So it is nicely flexible in that way. There are some things that are really good about it. Um, I think if it does become something that commercial organizations start working towards, it is probably gonna be because their competitors all work for government and have filled this out. And now they've got this really nice, big detailed list of IGPs that they do that they can give to their non-government customers as well. So I suspect that that would be the way in. If you work in an industry that does sometimes work with government, even if you don't specifically, it might be something that your other customers are used to seeing or become used to seeing. Um, so that's that not yeah. perfect. And then well, one final question for the moment, specifically at this side, a slide. Peter Baird says, when I looked at CAF B2, I saw 20 outcomes in the achieved column. Where are the 59 indicators of good practice listed? Ah, OK, that's that's a really good question. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pop on to my next. Uh, here we go. So this was B2. Um, so yes, within B2, yeah, you've got these four contributing outcomes. Um, so under identity verification, authentication, authorization, you've got six listed as achieved, six partially and six not achieved. Um, so uh, in fact, the example I used here was identity and access management. So B2D has five achieved, four partially achieved and five not achieved. So if we then go to B2D, then this is, there's one, two, three, four, five here, one, two, three, four there, and then one, two, three, four there. So hopefully then you can see that for each one of these, you've got a, a bunch of IGPs. Uh, so, that, so it's all of those added up together is the 59. Yeah. Perfect, yeah. that makes sense. And the reason why we've, Sorry, the reason why I've counted it that way is because as part of GovAssure, you have to effectively provide a statement against each one of these. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find my... <clears throat> my throat. And I can't mute myself, so I'm just going to... Sorry about that. Um, okay, so uh, to walk through that in a little bit more detail then, this is what you end up responding for. When we say that you need to answer for each of the IGPs, for each of these different paragraphs, you will have to provide a statement. What does happen though is, 
um, you end up with some of the not achieved and partially achieved and achieved statements actually are kind of related to each other. Particularly, you find that not achieved is the inverse of achieved. Um, and, um, and that is, uh, in some way, it, so it reduces the number of things that you have to actually have to make a statement against. So I'm contradicting myself a little bit here, where, um, for example, greater rights are granted than necessary, um, but also you follow a robust procedure to verify each user and has the minimum required access rights. If you can see, those are kind of the inverse of each other. So what you have to do is say effectively that you don't do this and you do do this. And you then provide one statement saying, we have a robust procedure to uh, ensure that people only have the minimum rights as written into policy, and then you provide the policy as evidence, as an example. Um, but it would actually cover this, this, and potentially this IGP. But the way that they're grouped together is not necessarily obvious. It is provided um, within the webcaf, which is how you apply your answers. Um, but to begin with, a lot of organizations have started off with answering every single one of those and that resulting in a little bit of replication where they've answered the same thing across, say, these three different IGPs. Maybe, can everyone see that I'm pointing with my, my cursor, right? Um, yeah, we can see that. <laughs> good. Um, and that's part of why I wanted to put this slide up here and just, um, just make sure that it, it's relatively clear that there's a lot there's a lot of things that you need to write a statement against there are ways in which you can consolidate and ways in which you can make it a little bit quicker um, to complete it for example knowing that you need one statement to cover this one this one and this one um, and I, I believe that that's in some of the templates and certainly it's within the webcaf interface as you go to make these uh, put these answers into the, the webcaf that, which is the area that you upload the, the answers to. However, it's really useful to get a good view of that and a good understanding of that before you start sending the questions out to people. Um, and it's useful to get have a, a bit of a dialogue with people when you send them these because it's to be honest it can be a little bit weird for want of a better word because you're saying kind of you need to say no to this and yes to this um but actually you're kind of saying the same thing um so uh so what my advice would be is look at all of the IGPs and the way that it works in WebCAF. I think once you, you get into the detail of it, it does start to make sense, but just be aware of there's a moment um, and a, an activity which is effectively a bit of a, an internal um, training almost. Um, it doesn't take long, but I think you need to walk people through what these IGPs are and how to answer against them. Again, just to make sure that you're answering once and you, well, you're asking the question once, you're answering once. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, again, just shout out, do we have any questions on that? Because I appreciate that's a bit of a complex, uh, yeah, a bit of a complexity in the way that WebCAF works and the way that Covershaw is working. So I think there's an interesting question from uh, Rama Chandra Shikan. Um, maybe I'll use this opportunity to ask how much depth of information is required to be documented given that some of it could be very sensitive? So, uh, so that's a really good question and I could spend an hour talking about that. Um, I would say enough so that you can give your external assessor confidence that you know whether your answer is you achieve it, you don't achieve it or you partially achieve it. So, you know, we, we're not talking about paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs. We're talking about maybe three or four sentences, depending on how complex the actual implementation is, plus your evidence. And that is really the most important thing is the evidence. Um, when, we, when we work with uh, the organization, the evidence should be staying within the organization. So um, the, 
the evidence does not get uploaded to WebCAF. Um, it doesn't get sent to your external assessors. The evidence needs to stay within um, your organization. So whether that's a folder system that you then give your external uh, assessors access to, whether you're sharing screens, anything like that, but that's really, that's the key. So the depth of the answer is, you know, a, a, an average amount what you would write in an internal audit, but making sure you have the evidence available is a really critical thing. Cool. I think we're good to go from there. Thank you. All right. Lovely. Um, so that's that. Um, I've mentioned the webcaf a few times. So this is effectively it's a web interface where people upload and respond, provide the responses. Um, and what you are going to need to respond with is um, Firstly, does the statement match what the organization does for each IGP? For each one of these, you're gonna say, yes, we do this, or no, we don't. Um, they, they're using slightly different terminology now. So it's, um, this is applicable within my organization, or this is not applicable within my organization. So um, for example, if everyone has the right number of rights, then it is not applicable that greater rights are granted, but it is applicable that you follow a robust procedure to verify each user. If that makes sense. So it's a, the terminology is applicable or not applicable. We'll see how that works out. But um, uh, yeah, so you, you have to provide whether it's applicable or not applicable um, and an, an actual description as we're talking about of, of how that works. You then also will have an overarching achieved, partially achieved or not achieved for each contributing outcome. So that's each B2.D level, um, each, each of these sort of, I think third level down if you like. So you've got the, you've got an objective, a principle and at the uh, contributing outcomes level. So that third level down, you need to say whether you're achieved, partially achieved or not achieved. Um, and a statement overall for that as well. Um, so again, it's, it's a lot, right? Um, there's, there's quite a significant amount of words that you need to write. Um, okay, so that's that's webcaf. Um, I'm going to crack on because actually I think we've, we've only got like 15 minutes left, so crack on. And so the review, submit, and improve. Um, this bit is a little bit quicker. It's a little bit easier because you've gathered all that data. Um, the first thing that we try to do is review internally. So once you send this all out, everyone's filled out the information, provided it back to, usually there's sort of a central team that wants to look at the answers before they actually upload it to WebCAF. Um, but either way, you have a set of responses for each of the IGPs. Um, it is useful to look at that internally first and have just somebody sanity check to make sure that the responses make sense, that the evidence makes sense and matches what the actual IGP is. Um, uh, there's also, you know, you can look at your quick wins um, and you can, can see if there's anything that you can move from a, a not achieved to a partially achieved or partially up to achieved. Um, what's really, really useful in that kind of process is to keep in mind whether you are at baseline or enhanced. So that's already decided earlier. We already know whether you're baseline or enhanced, but because of the way that it works, you kind of just get asked everything across all of the IGPs. Um, it's, it's a bit of a quirk of the way that it works, but you, yeah, you have to answer for everything anyway, really. Um, so, but when it comes to closing gaps, it's probably useful to prioritize anything that's a quick win that will close a gap to make a not achieved achieved, um, and particularly if that's something that's actually required for the profile you're at. There's no, if you're at baseline, there's no point in make, trying to make everything achieved because actually you only need to be partially achieved on a bunch of different things. So just, it's really useful to keep that in mind when you talk about closing gaps. Um, and similarly later on when we talk about the targeted improvement plan. Um, okay, so review internally, you then submit for audit. So you upload the information into the WebCAF or you actually click submit in WebCAF. Um, again, you, you have to have everything completed before you submit. Um, so, so make sure that all of the questions are answered. Um, one point though on all of the questions being answered um, and I, th I think I've, I've got some, I've got a bullet point later on about this, but 
if the answer is we don't have any evidence of this or we weren't able to find the information, if what you're working to are really tight time frames, I think it's not unreasonable to answer truthfully that you don't know. Um, and that can then go into part of the longer term plan is to find out the answer. Because if you don't know, you probably don't do it. Um, but rather than spending a lot of time and a lot of effort going in and doing this really deep investigative work into something that you probably don't do, it's better to just say, we don't do this. We need to find the evidence, find out what we do, part of the long term plan, rather than spend the effort and the resources and direct those efforts and resources into making sure that you've got the right way you think you do do something, really making sure that you've got the evidence from looking right and the statements making sense and really focus on the areas where you can kind of sing your praises um, rather than focusing too much on areas that you know you're probably not going to pass anyway. Um, okay, and then you have the audit and review sessions with your external providers, which again, I'm assuming most people in the call are fairly familiar with the process of auditors come in and go, show me, tell me what you do, show me that you do it, give me the evidence. Um, and then the final step is this improvement plan, the targeted improvement plan. And that is, again, just to be really clear, nothing to do with your external auditors um, or external assessors. That will be between the organization and the cabinet office. Um, and that will be agreed um, primarily by the organization plus any suppliers and all of those other um, people that are involved. Um, and again, approach it from a risk-based perspective. If your improvement plan um, focuses on areas that aren't gonna give you the biggest value, that's not gonna be terribly helpful. So it's really useful to look at what your, um, what your profile is, uh, baseline or enhanced, focus on the areas that are gonna bring you into compliance with baseline if you're at baseline or that will can bring you into um, enhanced if you're at enhanced, but there are even there some things that you don't necessarily have to do in enhanced. Just be aware of those and build your, your plan around what's actually needed and required. Um, and then obviously implement those changes and that's gonna be as part of a longer term project. Um, so, uh, kind of went through that last little bit fairly quickly, but actually I think that second half in some ways is the more straightforward thing because we're used to as an organization uh, getting assessed and then being told, here are your gaps, let's go fix it, let's do a project around that. Um, and for me, the, the main thing is um, just, yeah, making sure that you're prioritizing things correctly um, and, uh, and using your resources effectively. With that, any more questions, any follow on questions? Fantastic. No, really, that was absolutely brilliant, Isabel. I think we covered a huge amount of um, ground there. Um, so thank you very much for that. We've dealt with a lot of questions during, but we do have a couple more. So um, I'll start with, I guess, I guess the, the the cheekiest question one can ask is, given that you've given us you know, a, an, an hour of your time explaining all this, what's the most important thing to do? What's what's the one thing that we really need to do to focus on to to get that compliance? I think that the most thing, the most important thing, there are a couple of things that are really important. The first one I would say is that first step that we spoke about with getting the buy in yep. from senior management. If you don't have people responding to your questions, you're never going to do it. Like it, it will be literally impossible if you don't have senior management and and also the management that sit kind of underneath that and the people that sit underneath that willing to contribute then you're you're lost right that is the single most important thing is really kind of winning over and, and convincing people that they need to do this um for whatever reason the second most important thing i i would say is um focus on honest answers yep. right so um so really making sure that when you don't know something, that's fine. But if you, the purpose, if we go back to the original purpose of this, which is to baseline, um, cabinet office don't want, well, we, you know, we're quite good at this. You know, we, you know, if, if we had more resources, we would do it this way. What they want is, this is the reality of our situation. We can't do this because we don't have enough time and money. 
Um, and if you can, if you can write that narrative, you then have a better opportunity to get the time and money to actually make those improvements. So that's the, the other really important thing that I haven't quite mentioned yet is see this as an opportunity to build your ROI, to build your business cases. If you're not doing something, then say that you're not doing it. It's okay to say we need to that something's yeah, yeah that a control's not in place. That's fine, but it's not okay to extend the truth. I will say absolutely. Um, I think related to that, Liz um, Wilmot Harrop has asked, you've just touched on evidence. As you can't submit the actual evidence on the portal, have you any tips on how people collect, store and share evidence with the assessors? Mm, it's a really good question. Um, for me, I, you know, when, I, when I've been an auditor myself, um, what I have really, really appreciated is a folder structure that matches the standard. Yeah. So if you can have, you know, a folder for objective A and then a subfolder for your underlying objective evidence, and then the actual, you know, the screenshot labeled with the specific IGP, each IGP has its own reference. Mm. You can label it with each IGP reference. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, it, it makes our lives so much easier. And it means that you have a fairly straightforward way of working out if you have all of the evidence that you need. So for me, put it in folders and then give your, auditors read only access to those folders if that's a possibility for your organization from a technical perspective okay. that's how i i think it's probably easiest to do that makes sense and then uh, a question from russell spencer which um we may open up to the floor a little bit do you have any thoughts as to why the rest of government seems to be taking a completely different approach to the mod who've only just launched their secure by design approach as a replacement for their dart process uh he says we're currently trying to get grips with spd and we now have this to deal with I don't know. I, uh, I don't have an answer to why the MOD is doing things differently. Um, certainly not that I would say here, but I, I mean, I would, I would say though that the MOD obviously has quite different attack profiles. It has quite different threats. It isn't the same as the rest of government. So I suspect that that is a huge part of that story. Um, but I don't really have any insight into it, particularly, I'm afraid. No, that makes sense. Cool. Well, um, Isabel, I think I'm just going to go quick squiz through the chat to make sure that I haven't missed anybody. Um, if I close the chat window, that really doesn't help, does it? Uh, da, da, da. I think we have covered everything. Um, da, dum, dum. Yeah. I just hum while I'm doing it. It's a distracting habit, right? Um, but uh, Isabel, I think we're done. Thank you so much. We've had, as you can see from the questions we've had, you've been obviously you've really engaged the audience. Um, everyone's really interested. We have been asked if we're able to share that presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, um, so I think what we'll do, uh, Rama, is we will um, we'll attach it. Well, Danny will deal with it because he deals with all the difficult stuff. I just sit here and look at you. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll um, we'll happily um, we'll happily share that presentation with Isabel's uh, say so. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attendance today. Um, I hope this has been uh, useful to you. I've certainly found it fascinating, and it answered an awful lot of the questions about the oh my god, what next? Which is which is effectively what we all need, right? So again, Isabel, thank you so much for um, being so willing to share your uh, your experience and your expertise. You are very welcome. And thank you everyone for the questions. They're really, really great questions. Really appreciate them. So yeah, thank, thank you for engaging.